So I've been working on this game for a while about a plant-loving robot living in a post-apocalyptic cave system trapped underground and trying to recreate a bustling plant ecosystem from scratch. And our robot here, well, he's generally a happy camper. But recently I've been giving him a lot of new toys to play with, and he isn't too happy that every single time I close the game and restart, he's back to square one and is left with nothing, always cursed to give up everything that was gained the last time that the game was run. So in the best interests of the robot, and probably the gameplay too, we need to start saving the game. And how are we going to do that, you might ask? Compiler hacks, of course. What else would you expect? So to fix our problem, what we need to be able to do is to serialize the game data. That is, take everything that's in our game, write it out to the disk, and then read it back in the next time the game is started up so that we persist our game world, items, player stuff, everything, basically. Now, maybe every game since the dawn of the industry has done this in some form or capacity. So there are definitely existing solutions that we could use for this problem. But if you know anything about this channel, you know that I think they're not good enough and I don't want to use them. So we're going to be rolling our own. And while this might not make sense if I was using a language with a big, nice serialization API that was pretty fast and reliable, C++ uh, doesn't have that at all. And all of the existing solutions that I've seen require that your data be structured in a certain way or would require a lot of boilerplate anyways on top of them to get them to actually work to save a game world. So now that I've talked down about hundreds of thousands of hours of work done by programmers 10 times better than I'll ever be, what's the solution that I'm bringing to the table? What is it that I want that nobody else has done yet? Well, let me paint a picture for you. See, the first programming language that I learned was a small, object-oriented, would-be successor language to C++ introduced in 1995. You probably haven't heard of it, but it's called Java. This small, relatively unknown language, Java, provides a reflection library, meaning that if you have some class, you can ask the runtime about what fields and methods are on that class, and you can get them programmatically. For example, here on this class foo, we will be able to see that it stores two integers, x and y, and get their values out of runtime without explicitly using the fields. We could even invoke methods on foo, by name, at runtime again if it had any. This is obviously pretty useful for serialization. Instead of having to manually specify every foo we want to serialize, we need to write an integer x and an integer y, and we'll do that for every other type we want to serialize. We have some sort of reflection in our language, we can just give the serialization system a foo object, and then it can ask the reflection system what fields it has. That's my picture, and that's also enough of that music. So that's what we're after. But unfortunately, as you might have been able to predict from the title of this video, C++ does not have reflection at all. So instead of waiting to see what will happen first, the heat death of the universe or C++ getting a modern reflection system, I decided to go ahead and write my own. And like all good projects, before lifting up a finger to do any work at all, the most important thing for me was to come up with a good code name. So I dubbed it Archimedes, because it's a reflection system, get it? I thought it was kind of clever, you know, ancient Greek mathematician philosopher that mythologically used mirrors to reflect sunlight onto invading ships and burn them. Anyway, Archimedes, let's get started on it. So we need a reflection system for C++, how do we do it? Let's try plan A, which is write my own C++ parser. This sounds like a good idea in theory until you realize that C++ is a super complex language with a very complex grammar, some of which actually depends on the types of symbols that are encountered, and it's not even talking about template instantiations or other issues of the sort. This plan was an absolute non-starter. So plan B, write my own compiler. Well, if we need to instantiate templates, let's just do it ourselves. No, absolutely not. Have you seen how big existing C++ compilers are? So, plan C. Use libclang or some existing compiler infrastructure. Clang, or clang, or clang, or however you say it, is the C++ compiler that I use, and it's a part of the larger LLVM compiler infrastructure project. It exposes the C language API to itself where you can go through the AST, or abstract syntax tree, that is the internal programmatic representation of the C++ being parsed and do whatever you want with it. And this was the first solution that I actually got some progress out of. But it was quickly scrapped after I realized that templates weren't instantiated when going through the code, which would turn out to be a larger problem. Basically, I will go into the exact semantics of the problem because that would probably take more time than the entire runtime of this video. But what this basically means with templates is that we need the code after the compiler is done with it and it's done semantic analysis and everything. So we went to plan D, 
use LLVM debug information. In order to use debuggers, or LLDB in the case of LLVM and Clang, C++ compilers can emit debug information alongside the program that gives the exact type of info we're looking for about fields, type, names, class memory layouts, and all that sort of stuff. I briefly tried to parse out this information using LLVM's built-in libraries, but it turned out not to work for me either. Specifically, some of the C++ specific info like constexpr and static fields were kind of lost in compilation to IR, making the solution also not viable for me. So back to the drawing board for the final time for Plan A. Abuse the compiler, write a plugin for it and generate C++ code which contains information about the code that was compiled, and then compile that C++ code again to use in our final program. At some point in plans A through D, I found out that Clang supports plugins which can hook into the compiler at any point in the compilation process, take a peek at what the compiler is up to, and most importantly, not introduce the overhead of invoking the compiler again just to get the reflection info. After some initial poking around and familiarizing myself with the LLVM and Clang C++ APIs, I was pretty sure this was the way to go, so it was time to get started. So the very first thing to do when gathering all of our type information was to define some structures to put all the data in, which you can see here. For example here, for each type we store a unique index or ID for it, its name, a fully qualified name with namespaces, nested structs and stuff like that, and its underlying primitive type if that's applicable, among a bunch of other different information for different kinds of types like enumerators, function types, struct types, member pointer types, these definitely weren't complete in the start, and many, many things ended up being added to them and redefined as I developed the library. My very first goal for the first version of the library was just to fill up these structures with as much type information as I could find on the AST that Clang gave me. And you can see here from this generated code that the initial approach was basically just to generate a bunch of C++ struct values and then embed them as constants, which will then get compiled and of course linked into the final application. You can also see here we're auto-generating some invoker functions, which take these array of any's, which are like a thin wrapper for a pointer or a value of any argument of any type, and then it will call a method or a static method or a free function or something like that, which will let us programmatically call methods on arbitrary objects. The most important thing here is that we're subverting the type system and that all of this stuff is being done at runtime, which, while it sounds wildly unsafe, is exactly what we want. And I know I'm making this all look easy, smooth, and simple, but at this point of the project, I had written maybe three or 4,000 lines of code across four, five, six days or something like that. So it was a big mess and kind of a miracle that the program could do anything at all. But after about a week of hacking, it was time to do the responsible thing and add tests. So I really quickly hacked together this test runner, which would basically just gather up a bunch of executables, run them, and check their exit code. If they failed, then it would print failure, and if they didn't, then it would say all tests pass. Here we can see that we have a couple failing tests, which was definitely not the first time or the last time that I saw this error. And it turns out that, as one might expect, I had seriously underestimated how hard this project would actually be. C++, it turns out, as no one knew before I discovered it, of course, is wildly complicated and it's really, really, really hard to get correct code gen for reflection when you're feeding something arbitrary types, say like things in the standard library, which look like this. And it's not that this code is bad or doesn't work or is incorrect or anything like that. It's just that the more C++ features that are being used by code that I'm trying to process, the more edge cases I need to handle. And I basically just kept encountering edge case after edge case after edge case after edge case that I wasn't handling. I think if someone smarter than me who'd maybe programmed in C++ for over the eight or nine months of experience that I have did this project, they probably would have been able to see this coming. Anyway though, the code got some pretty big band-aids during this time, up to and including yoinking code out of another C++ interpreter project just to print type names correctly, because at some point after hours and hours of trying to get it to work, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't look at it anymore, and so I just stole some code. License is correct and everything, nothing uh, illegal going on here, but it's not my proudest moment. And it turns out some of the edge cases with name printing were so bad that I had to go into this code that I'd stolen from the other project and go and add more edge cases that would handle for default template arguments and stuff like that. And yeah, sorry, this has just been my life for the last few weeks. 
but after a few thousand lines of code and a bunch of bug fixes later, I could eventually try and let this loose on the game code that I'd already written. And basically it crashed a bunch. I got a bunch of errors and more errors and more errors and more errors. And this was basically my life until I ended up with a total of, just a sec, let me count them. Uh, 54 full end-to-end -end tests. All passing though, meaning finally, after a little over 9,000 lines of code, you know, no big deal, I could finally get to work on the reason I made this video and this system, the serialization system and save games. Or so I thought, I actually needed to add a little bit more to the program at this point because it turns out that this all doubled my compile times, which was, you know, that's pretty bad, especially considering how slow my compile times are in the first place. The solution I came up with, however, is elegant. See, up until this point, we were just getting all the type information and then emitting source code that contained the C++ structs in it. And this takes a while because the compiler needs to go over all of this and check it again, even though we already know that it's probably correct, unless there's something very wrong, because we've emitted the C++ code, we haven't handwritten it. And the solution to the compile time problem here is twofold. First, I wrote a really quick serializer in my reflection library to basically just take all of this data and then crunch it down into bytes that just end up getting embedded in the program. And then on top of that, instead of emitting source code, I have the compiler now actually call itself inside of the plugin to compile this to an object file immediately so that we don't need to invoke the compiler a second time. It's a compiler in a compiler, if you will. This is a little bit what I've meant when I've said misusing and hacking the compiler. Anyway though, with that out of the way, finally time to get back to the game and turn that robotic frown upside down. So what we need to do is take the reflection information that we've generated and use it to serialize arbitrary objects. So I started out with a little bit of design work on this, just some thoughts down on paper which you can see here, you can pause and try to read them, but it's basically just a spec of everything we kind of need to serialize game data. And rather than going through the extra couple of lines of code that I went through to implement this, let me show you a quick example of kind of what this lays out. So basically again, we have the struct foo, which could be arbitrary, it could be an entity, it could be an item, it could be whatever, but it's got two fields, X and Y, both integers then we need to define an integer serializer that can serialize those integer types, which is a specialization of some template that has these two serialize and deserialize functions on it, which read and write to and from arbitrary data stores, which are called archives in my code. Then basically we want to be able to make some serializer for this foo object that will automatically look at foo's layout, look at its memory layout, then accept a foo object with X and Y fields being whatever values they are and write them out into some archive and be able to read them back out as they were. Combining this approach with some specific annotations which allow us to serialize pointers by arbitrary IDs and to ignore certain fields on certain types we end up with a serialization system that was honestly pretty easy to implement after the primitive stuff was done. The 10,000 lines of reflection code and the compiler plugin are really the ones doing the heavy lifting here. So with the serialization code written, I started giving it some tests in practice to see how things went with the game. I got items working first and I gave my game the world's best item do bug. You can just see me saving and reloading the player state here, including the inventory and the stone just doubling and doubling and doubling. Oh, and don't worry about the fancy new inventory and stuff, we'll get to all that in a second. But it was pretty much smooth sailing from here on implementing the rest of the serialization. It did require that I kind of messed around with how the memory allocation is done and my level and for my entities and everything, but that was long overdue anyway. I really needed to start using arena allocators and actually thinking about object lifetimes rather than just using smart pointers and trying to forget about it. Anyway though, after many long days of work on a reflection system, many more long days of work on a serialization system, and many other days that were spent upgrading the rest of the game engine, we now have level saves that just work. And they take like 16 milliseconds on my machine, which is, which is awesome. Now, I still think that the reflection system was overkill, and doing this by hand probably would have saved me time, but I can't help but be proud of it. The code for the entire reflection system, not the serialization yet because it's part of the game engine, but the reflection system can be found in the description. 
but you're also probably looking at this and wondering, hey, it looks like there's a lot of new stuff in there. So let's go really quickly through what else has been added, aside from the reflection and serialization systems, of course, to the game. First off, we have a whole new inventory and UI system along with batteries and stuff like that integrated. These will be a really important game mechanic with making sure that your battery always stays up so the robot doesn't get stuck somewhere because it has to use battery to do everything of course. Please also note this very nice pixel perfect camera smooth move up when the inventory is open. That one took me a while to do. Then I've also added animated item sprites. You can see whenever we go to get a plant, the claw tool that the robot is holding clamps together. I was thinking this should look like those plastic toy robot claws that you can find in every toy store, or at least you could 10 years ago. Then as you could probably see from the battery in the inventory, items can now store arbitrary metadata on themselves. Oh, and the robotanist can fly now. But if you saw the last live stream that I did a couple of months ago, you probably saw part of the implementation for that already. Oh, and also to give the robot some more plants, I've also added these new hydrangea flowers that you've been seeing, which come in all different shapes and sizes, which also required a little bit of a refactoring to how flower rendering was done. And well, that's basically it. Thank you for joining me on my compiler hacking game dev journey. Hopefully the next video won't take me two months to make. So uh, see you again soon and thanks for watching. Oh, and be sure to check out the code in the description, but be warned, it is a mess. It is, it is some of the worst code that I've ever published, so don't expect anything impressive.